in our study. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just uh, praise you and thank you that you have brought us all together this morning. And we look forward to a, a great time of learning and uh, being encouraged by uh, your word. And we pray, Lord, that even though the next uh, several chapters in the book of Revelation um, are full of uh, uh, evil, full of your judgment, full of uh, just um, how, how bad things will be on this earth during the tribulation, we know, Lord, that uh, as our Savior, you are indeed worthy, as we saw in chapters 4 and 5. And so we pray that you will bless our time together and... Uh, Help us as best as we can to understand uh, the contents of chapter 6 and going forward. And uh, so that at the end we'll be able to just continue to praise you for your goodness, for your compassion, for your grace, for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Okay, I was going to ask, I was going to begin by asking the question, how many of you read through the notes and your handouts and Revelation, but you don't have to raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I went through it myself several times, okay, because it takes a while to, to understand this. Um, before we begin, do you have any comments or any questions or frustrations that you want to share about um, your study of chapter 6, what you read? Uh, through the notes and um, the uh, various charts. Any, any good or bad, okay? So I get an idea of where you folks are at. You know. How many of you have just question mark where you're kind of you know, overwhelmed by all of this? Okay, yeah. Um, Right. right, right, right. And we'll get to that. You know, a lot of people, when you look at the first seal and the rider on the, the white horse, uh, some people think that's Jesus Christ. But um, again, when you interpret Scripture, when you look at Scripture, uh, there's another rider comes on a white horse later on. So, uh, and we know from our study when we get there that the rider on the white horse um, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he comes to set up his millennial kingdom. Uh, this is, I think, chapter 19. Yeah, chapter 19, you see a white horse. So this morning I'm going to make, uh, um, to clarify, I'm going to make a distinction between the rider on that white horse, which I believe is Christ, and the rider on the white horse here, which is the Antichrist. And there's differences. Okay, So, uh, but yeah, a common interpretation is that the white, the, the white horse uh, rider in chapter 6 is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but this is where, this is where um, biblical interpretation uh, principles really are important. Okay, because one of the things that we talked about in the beginning was when you look at scripture, first of all, you want to look at the historical and the cultural setting. Okay, so what's the history? And we went through this as we looked at where John was during the first century when he received this vision. So we look at the history, we look at the culture, and we tied that into the letters to the seven churches. And the important, the important um, principle of hermeneutics is going to be the context. So when you study scripture, you look at the historical cultural analysis, then you look at the contextual analysis. Okay? What's the context? And you look, this is where you compare scripture with scripture. You compare what's happening in the earlier chapters in Revelation with the latter chapters. Uh, this is where you also try to bring in studies from the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament uh, say concerning these events in the book of Revelation? So context, that's, that's an important thing. And all of us can look at history, culture, you know, you have the internet, you maybe have resources, Bible dictionaries. You can look at the history, you can look at the culture, you can look at the context, just as you, you don't need to know Greek or Hebrew to understand the context, okay? I was told when I was a young Christian, 
Uh, if you have questions as you're reading, just keep reading, and, and in most cases, the Bible will answer the questions that you have, because you'll find it uh, in the you know, contextual analysis. Um, what we also look at, and to some degree you can do this, we look at the literary and the, what we call syntactical analysis. Uh, the literary is more the words, okay? The words. So that's where word studies come in. And if you have resources, there are good resources. I think there's Vines, V-I-N-E, apostrophe S. Vines, uh, back in my day, it was Vines, Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. And then uh, for the Old Testament, there's a, I don't know if it's still two volumes, uh, Old Testament, uh, Theological uh, Word Book of the Old Testament. And you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew, even though you know, it would be written in there. But uh, there's a lot of transliteration. So there's tools to understand word studies. And when we talk about syntactical analysis, is how the words relate to each other. So that's where we look at grammar, okay, grammatical structure, and, and how it ties in. And then we look at theological analysis. We bring it all together, and what does this passage tell us about uh, our theology, about theology of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, so, you know, all of us can do, what I'm going to do here is try to share with you um, based on those principles, okay? Now, I was recently asked, are there any good commentaries on the book of Revelation? And generally there's two commentaries, but I have to admit, I have not looked at them since my seminary days. Okay, and that was back in 85. Okay, and by the way, I took Revelation uh, in seminary my last year. We never got through the book, okay? Why? Because we were dealing with all the controversy and the issues, and we got bogged down. So I don't think we even got halfway. But we got to feel that Revelation is a very difficult book because there are a lot of different views, okay? Scholars, scholars who have studied this book they don't agree, okay? So uh, I haven't looked at my, there's John Walvoord, there's a classic, 1966, The Revolution of Jesus Christ. And there's one other one, um, uh, J.B. Robinson, I think. Um, and he wrote one, okay? But in any study um, from, so you know where I'm coming from, I, I, I rarely look at commentaries. I have commentaries, but I don't look at them. And Revelation, if you, if you want commentaries, and you look and you get commentaries, what will happen is, as you read the commentary, you'll get more confused, okay? Because not everyone's gonna agree on the, scholars aren't gonna agree, I'm not a scholar, but I know they're not gonna agree with what I have, to, you know, what I say. But what I've been doing, and that's why it takes hours and hours and hours, uh, applying the principles of hermeneutics and digging it out for myself. When I was in school taking, Greek and Hebrew, the professor would say, you know, they would say, yeah, if you want a commentary, here's a commentary, but we never use commentaries in class. We went to the, in the, the language classes, we went to the, the Hebrew text or the New Testament, Greek New Testament, in the English Bible, we just went to the Word of God, okay? And the, the reasoning was that we were told, if you dig it out for yourselves, you dig it out for yourselves, you'll be blessed. You know, you find a treasure and you, you know, instead of handing it to you, you find it yourself. There's more meaning and more blessing to that, okay? And I remember we were told, if you want to get a commentary and you want to regurgitate and teach it in your churches, why come to seminary and waste your money? You can just buy commentaries and you can teach that. So what they did in school was to give us the tools. And whenever we were in class, we never opened commentaries. Okay, we weren't encouraged to read comment. We just dealt with the text. So um, in our Monday night study we had in 2 Corinthians, I never had a commentary. I don't have a commentary on 2 Corinthians. It was just basically applying the principle of biblical interpretation. Same thing with Revelation. That's why it's taking hours and hours and hours. Okay. But uh, there's, there's many, many gems. And I've been digging up some gems. And that's why it's exciting. So I, I hope that I can convey that to you. You know, just by, you don't need to know the languages, just read and read and read, you'll be blessed. And, and, and as you ask the Holy Spirit to um, uh, bless you in the reading and study of his word, 
uh, what will happen is that you will reap the blessings. You will say, hey, I never saw this. Okay, and I share with you, I had a professor in, in Hebrew, when we were in advanced Hebrew, my last year we studied Micah, which is a difficult book in the Hebrew. And one morning he came to class, Dr. Astell said, you know, I've been teaching this class for over 20 years. I just saw this for the very first time this morning. And his eyes lit up. And I said, that's what I want to experience too. Okay, the joy and the blessing of uh, finding these treasures in God's word. And you'll never exhaust uh, God's word. So, Revelation is a book that if you uh, look at what this, the scholars say, you're going to become more confused. So I'll present to you, and already you've seen, I've shared, this is a view, this is a view, this is a view, and I don't know what view is correct, or this is the view I, I prefer. So you already know in our study of the first five chapters that there's a lot of differences of opinion as to uh, what interpretation is correct, okay? And we won't know this side of eternity, what, which one is ex exactly. But the, like I said, the end result, you know, we know what the end result is going to be. Okay, we know what the end result is going to be. Okay, so let's look at Revelation 6. And we'll go through it slowly. And we, we, we find here that beginning in Revelation chapter 6, we have the major section of this book. If you go back to the original handout I gave you about uh, the breakdown of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19 deals specifically with the tribulation, that seven-year period of tribulation, of testing on this earth. Okay, so there's a lot there. And what will happen is, as we go through Revelation 6 through 19, there might be a tendency for you to get really depressed about this, okay? Uh, because you're going to see judgment, 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 all right? And, but kind of keep in mind, I think when, you, when you, we study the judgments of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 6 through 19, the fall of Babylon, the beasts, and all of that, at the end, you're going to be blessed because you're going to see God as a worthy God. God is a God of love and blessing, especially when we study the millennium and we you know, have uh, uh, study the, the New Jerusalem, you know, the, the eternal state. Uh, then you're gonna see, in contrast to the judgment of the tribulation, how loving, how merciful, how compassionate God really is. We've already seen that. Okay, we've already seen that in chapters uh, four and five. For example, uh, when we looked at chapter four, we saw the four living creatures and the four living creatures around the throne of God. And they were saying in verse, uh, verse 8 of chapter 4, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So there's a reference to the holiness of God. There's a reference to the sovereignty of God in the term Almighty. And there's a reference to the eternality of God who is and who was, or who was, who is, and who is forever, who is to come. And then you notice that in verse 11, um, the 24 elders uh, who sat on the throne will worship him, verse 10, and notice what they say in verse 11, worthy are you, our, 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 our Lord. In other words, deserving, you are indeed deserving, um, uh, it is fitting of you, and our God to receive glory. Glory is splendor, grandeur, uh, honor, his respect and recognition, and power, strength. For you created all things, and because of your, your will, they existed and were created. So God here is, God the Father in chapter four is being praised for his creative work, okay? So he's, he's, he's um, you know, he's praise worthy, you know, you re, you're worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for you create all things. And then when we got to chapter 5, we saw here in verse 8 that um, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. So chapter 5 switches over to Jesus Christ. So in chapter 4, God the Father is worshipped. Chapter 5, Jesus Christ is worshipped. And notice what they did in, in verse 9. They sang a new song saying, worthy. Again, 
Worthy are you to take the book and to break his seals, for you were slain, referring to Christ's crucifixion, uh, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. That's the redemption work of Jesus Christ. And that you have made them to be kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's the appointment of God. So you have a reference here to the future uh, millennial reign of Christ, where the saints will, will rule and reign with them. And then in verse 12, you see the angels, the angels who are worshiping, and they say, Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, so you have uh, these different groups, the, the four living creatures, you have the 24 elders, which uh, I believe represent the, the church, um, and then you have the angels. They're all worshiping God. They're all worshiping God. Okay. And so we come into chapter 6 and on through chapter 19 and we look at the tribulation. Hopefully at the end of, our, of chapter 19 and when we get into chapter 20 and on, we will also be able to say, worthy are you, O Lord. Worthy are you. Okay. Uh, for, your, for your creative power, for your, your redemption, the salvation you have provided for us. I believe that's going to become clearer as you look at verses six, chapter six through nineteen, and you look at what's ahead, following all the terrible things on earth. What will? Uh, I, I think the natural response is for us to say, "Worthy, you are worthy of all praise, all glory, honor, and power." Okay, and so I, I, I trust that will happen with you. Okay, but before we get there, we have to. Uh, go through these uh, the judgments. And we look at the seal judgments today. And beginning of chapter 6, like I said, we come to uh, the major section of the book which details the judgments and the events of the tribulation. Uh, from its beginning all the way until, all the way through to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 19, the last part of chapter 19. So, Revelation 6 refers to the judgment chapters, or it begins the judgment chapters. And what we find here, again, in context, okay, when you look at the context, um, the Lamb, the Lamb who was worshipped in chapters, chapter 5, now acts as a judge in chapters 6 and 7 by, by opening the seals of this scroll. Okay? So, the, the lamb who was uh, uh, worshipped in chapter 5 now serves as a judge in chapter 6 and 7. Okay, so what does this tell us? <laughs> it tells us that we, it reminds us that we need to maintain a balanced view of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Okay, yes, he is our savior and we praise him for that. And that's what Christmas is all about. The coming, the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and He came to save the world. Okay? But we have to understand too that He is a judge. He is a judge. Okay? He is a judge. Uh, there's consequences for um, violating uh, His uh, standards of purity and holiness. And so uh, we're going to see that throughout. Uh, um, this uh, this chapter. Okay, so judgments of the tribulation. You have this handout. Okay, so bring these with you each time from here on. But you have the judgments of the tribulation. Okay, so I want you to take a look at this. If you, <clears throat> what we find here, that the the chapters that follow, all the way through chapter nine to chapter nineteen, contain three series of seven judgments each. Okay, so that's on your top part of the page here. You have seven, seven, seven. So you have three series. You have the seals, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. So three series of seven judgments each. So if you want to do the math, 21 judgments. Okay, so the seven seals, if you, when you look at the chart, is chapter 6, 1 to 8, 1. And that's what we'll be looking at today and uh, probably into next week. And then 
The seven trumpets will be chapter 8, verse 2 to chapter 11, verse 19. Okay, and I'll explain this interlude and what those parentheses are. And then you have the seven bowl, bowls, or some people refer to as vials. They're not vials like laboratory vials, but they're more bowls. So there are seven bowls, uh, treatment, uh, uh, judgment, chapter 15, verse 1, all the way through chapter 16, verse 21. Okay, and you'll notice here, if you look at this, uh, your handout, there is a parenthesis, okay, parenthesis, parenthesis of additional material that we'll look at, and I'll give you that as we go along. And it's inserted between the six and seven judgments of each series. So you see the seals, you see one through six in the parentheses. Okay, there's a, there's a parenthesis that goes between uh, the sixth and the seventh uh, seal. And same thing with the trumpets. There's a parenthesis that goes between the sixth and seventh trumpets. And likewise with the bowls. Okay, so that's, uh, and I'll explain what this, the parenthesis is. Okay, that's what makes the study of Revelation difficult. Because when people say, uh, they get confused, yeah, you have some chronology issues, okay? And so as I studied and studied and studied, you know, I get confused too. I said, and when I look at the context and look at other chapters, scripture, scripture, I said, this has to be this way here, all right? And I could be wrong, but for now, this is what I see, okay? So you have the, the parenthesis of uh, additional material that's going to be inserted between the sixth and seventh judgments of each series. And you'll notice too that there's a spacing at the end of the seventh trumpet. Okay, there's a spacing before you hit uh, bowl number one. So there's, a, there's parentheses inserted between the trumpet and the bowl judgments. Okay, and there's also um, uh, parentheses. Uh, uh, right before the return of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. So after the seventh bowl. Okay. So what, the, what these parentheses will do is will introduce us to key events and key individuals um, that will, uh, I guess, heighten the drama of the tribulation or add more confusion concerning the tribulation, depending on how you look at it. It either heightens the drama, or you're gonna say, I'm totally overwhelmed, okay? This is where many Christians stop reading the book of Revelation, because they start hitting the, seal, the judgment and say, what is going on here? And they quit. So they never, or they'll, they'll jump to chapter 20, because, oh, that's a positive, but, You've got to get to chapter 20 through chapter 6 through 19. Okay. Here's the thing. Don't worry about the chronology. This is for your information. All right. Don't worry about the chronology. What we want to focus on is the content. What is the content of these, uh, these judgments? Okay. And that will help us to understand later on uh, how wonderful our Savior Jesus Christ is. Okay. And you're gonna see the compassion of God, you're gonna see the love of God, the mercy of God throughout the Revelation, the book of Revelation. Okay, so how do the three series of judgments relate to each other? Okay, so here's where the confusion, I mentioned to you there's uh, uh, 14 different views. Okay, and then there are three major ways of looking at the people have looked at Revelation. You have the seal, trumpets, and the bowls. And so some, some will look at these three sets of judgments as being parallel. In other words, they refer to seven judgments, but um, these are three different ways or three different perspectives of the judgments. It's like uh, when you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay, each one is different how they view their, their similar events in these Gospels, but uh, because of the emphasis of the writers, they'll look at a particular event, maybe a healing event or a miracle, and report different things from their perspective. So some look at the book of Revelation, the sealed trumpet judgment as seven judgments, 
seen from three different perspectives. Okay. Others will look at the book of Revelation as, oh, let me erase this here. They'll look at these, these uh, seven, or these three series of judgments as consecutive. So you'll see the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and then the bowl judgments. Okay, so they'll look at as being sec, uh, consecutive. So the seventh seal ends, and then the first trumpet begins. Okay, and then the seventh trumpet ends, and the first bowl begins. Okay, what you have here on the bottom, especially on the bottom, is uh, a, perhaps a combination of the two. Uh, instead of perhaps closest to this but not quite that, okay? So I believe that the, the best view uh, suggests a combination of these two views. So this is where you look at the bottom half of this uh, chart here. So what we find here is that um, in the bottom half here, you see you have seals one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And then you have that, um, this thing is angling off. In other words, you have uh, seal judgments one, two, three, four, five, six, and seal judgment number seven opens up the trumpet uh, section, uh, tr trumpet judgments. So, have I lost anyone yet? <laughs> okay, so instead of consecutive, out of the seventh seal, you start opening up the, bold, uh, the trumpet judgments and out of the seventh uh, trumpet, the seventh uh, trumpet judgment, it opens up the bold judgments, okay? So that's how you interpret that. This goes along with the, the top half. Okay, again, just look at your notes that I gave you and then study this. This is my view of, you know, after all these years of study, this is the view I've come on. I could be wrong, okay? And if I'm wrong, that's fine, okay, <laughs> you know. Uh, because I look at it this way, scholars are wrong. Well, scholars, they disagree, so, hey, I'll just join the group, you know. I won't feel bad if, you know, we have 14 different views, and only one of, one of them holds this. I'll say, okay, you know, this, this makes sense as you apply the principles of hermeneutics to the study. Okay? But if I'm wrong, hey, that's okay. okay. Because the emphasis is not going to be on the tribulation, it's going to be what's after. And I'm looking for the eternal state. I'm not looking at the tribulation. I'm not going to be here. So it doesn't make any difference you know, what happens on this earth. Okay. It's going to make a difference if you know people who are unsaved. If the rapture occurs today, okay, and you have family and friends that aren't saved, um, even during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, it's not going to be an easy time. And we're going to take a look at that. Okay. And if they happen to be here, during the last three and a half years, it's going to be a terrible time. Okay. Primarily for the Middle East, but it's going to be affecting the whole world, as we're going to see as we get through this. So this is what this chart, just kind of keep looking at it. And as we go along, I'll explain, and we just follow, uh, follow this. Uh, and then, but we'll look at, we'll focus on the content of these judgments. Okay, any questions or um, any expressions of frustration? which is okay with me, okay? I deal with frustration all the time, so. Okay, so. Um, okay, I think, I think on your notes I also have, um, let me see what I wrote down here. Okay, on the bottom half of page one of your notes, what is the chronology of the judgments relative to the tribulation? Okay. This confuses uh, folks, you know, you, you know and, uh, but I put it in there because I didn't know of any better way of trying to explain what's happening here. So I'll just kind of go over it really quickly. You can look at it, and then when we get to those sections, um, uh, we'll, we'll delve into it more, in more detail. Chapter six and nine, through nine, which is the sealed judgments, and then you have the 144,000, okay? the trumpet judgments, so six through nine, 
And then chapter 17, which will be the great harlot uh, Babylon. And they occur, I believe, in the first half of the tribulation. Okay, the first half of the tribulation. Uh, then chapters 10 through 14, and also chapter 17 again, occur in the middle of the tribulation. Okay, and you'll see um, a woe, the, first, the third woe in chapter 11, verse 14. And that's when uh, Satan is identified as being cast out of heaven into the earth in chapter 12. And this is when I believe Satan is going to break that covenant with Israel in the middle of the tribulation. Okay, there's going to be peace the first three and a half years when Satan is cast out of heaven, you know, when he's thrown out of heaven permanently. Okay, Satan has access to heaven right now. Okay, and he accuses saints, he accuses Christians before the Lord. But there's coming a time when he's going to be cast out of heaven uh, permanently. And I believe this is when he breaks the covenant with Israel in the middle of uh, the seven year period and it begins what they call what we refer to as the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years. And then the middle of the tribulation uh, occurs with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Okay, so when we get to the seventh trumpet, um, that's when you're gonna, we're gonna be looking at um, the middle of the tribulation uh, period uh, begins. Okay. And then chapters 15 and 16, the bold judgments, and chapter 18, which will be the judgment fall of the great city of Babylon occurring the second half of the tribulation. And then to add to the confusion, um, uh, you have other events occur in the first half of the tribulation at the same time as the chronological events. Okay. So that's why people have asked, uh, what's the challenge with Revelation? It's the chronology. Okay. Generally speaking, what you have on your chart, it follows a chronological pattern, all right? But there are also events that you have to kind of pull from here, bring it here, and that's what makes it difficult to understand. Okay. But again, don't worry about the chronology, just focus on the content, what's gonna happen here. Okay. Um, if you take out the error, you have another one, the seal judgments, this one here. And I'll, I'll give you a handout when we, uh, when we get to the trumpets and the bowls so you'll know exactly what judgments are in these, these various categories. Okay, so you have the seal judgments. Okay, Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 1 to chapter 8, verse 1. Okay, so this is, now we're going to get into our study of chapter 6. Here's the first seal. Chapter 6, verse 1, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, As with a voice of thunder, Come, I looked, that is John, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay. Um, do you know that, um, do you know that, you, know, you read about the dinosaurs, okay, that became extinct. And you know what a brontosaurus is? The brontosaurus, the big one, the huge one with the long neck. Okay, do you know that the brontosaurus was Greek? You ever thought about that? Because the word they use here, um, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of brontes. That's the Greek word. Brontes, we get the word brontosaurus, okay. The dinosaur, the thunder dinosaur, the dinosaur of thunder. So when I was looking at it, hey, Brontes, that's what we get, Brontosaurus. So Brontosaurus was Greek, okay? No, don't, 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 don't believe that. Just, that's what we got, <laughs> just, we got the word from, from that. And by the way, the word seven seals is hepta. Okay, heptagon is seven sided, seven angles. So, uh, so you have a lot of the Greek words that, uh, our English words come from uh, the Greek language. So, see, John is looking, and so is the lamb. Remember in chapter 5, John uh, grieved because, and he wept, because uh, he was told initially that no one was worthy of opening the seals of the scroll. And yet, uh, uh, one of the creatures said, uh, there is one who is worthy. And so, the lamb, Jesus Christ, takes the scroll from God the Father, 
and he opens up the seal. And by opening us, starting to open up the seal, as we saw in Jeremiah chapter 32 last week, Christ is saying, I hold the title deed to the earth. Okay, so in other words, I own the earth. Okay, and all the things that are happening is because of what I have, you know, what has been declared in eternity past. So he, is, he comes and says, he looked and behold a white horse and he was sat on the head of bull. Okay, so um, he has the right, he has the power to do as the possessor of the scroll and the scroll represents the title deed to the earth. So after each of the four seals are open, one of the four living creatures issues a command, come. And this charge is directed toward John. Uh, the voice of this first creature, first living creature, sounded like thunder. And what does thunder uh, uh, indicate to you? When you hear thunder, what does it tell you? There's a storm coming, right? There's a storm coming. And in scripture, in scripture, um, if you go back in your, into your study of uh, God's people in Egypt, you'll find that uh, the first mention of thunder was in reference to God's judgment upon Egypt because of her oppression of his people, Israel, in Exodus chapter 9, verse 23. So you might even want to write that down, that's not in your notes. Exodus chapter 9, verse 23. So this thunder at the outset of the tribulation signals the, the divine judgments, the ominous divine judgments and the human atrocities that will take place during this seven year period. And I mentioned in your notes that the white horse here is, and the rider is not Jesus Christ, but it symbolizes the Antichrist. So um, this, this, um, this tribulation period begins with the Antichrist uh, making a seven year covenant with the nation of Israel. Hey, so you remember, if you were here for the Daniel studies, uh, you know you have uh, you have this in your files and um, the seventy weeks of Daniel. Uh, I didn't put down the reference Daniel chapter nine verses twenty four through twenty seven. Okay, so let's let's take a few moments and go back to Daniel chapter nine. And if you have your notes, I'm not going to go into real detail, but if you have your notes on Daniel. Uh, go back and read through this because Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 really speaks of what happens on this chart. Okay, so this chart summarizes Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. And if you were, if you studied this chart last week or this past week, um, the 70 weeks of Daniel, one week equals seven years. Okay, one week equals seven years. So when we talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel, we're talking about a time period of 490 years, 70 times seven, 490. One week equals seven years, okay, 490 years. Okay, so Daniel receives this, uh, this prophecy. It says in verse 24, Daniel chapter nine, 70 weeks have been decreed. Actually the 70 is literally in the Hebrew 77s, 77s, that's where we get 490. So 70 weeks have been dec decreed for you people of your holy city to finish or to re restrain the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy place. So in verse 24, we have the summary statement of what this 70 weeks of Daniel is all about. Okay. Then he breaks it down. Daniel breaks down this, uh, this prophecy Verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem, that's Artaxerxes I's decree to restore Jerusalem, the very left side of your, uh, your hand out there. Okay, so uh, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So he said there'll be 69 weeks. So until Jesus Christ comes, there's going to be a 60 from the time Artaxerxes one makes a decree to go back for the people to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. There'll be 69 weeks until Messiah comes. Okay? So that's what Daniel's saying here. And it will be built again in plaza and mold even in times of distress. Then, verse 26, after the 62 weeks, 
the Messiah will be cut off. That's his crucifixion. So you see the picture of Christ on the cross there. So the, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who has come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And his end will come with a flood, even to the end, there will be war, desolations uh, are determined. Okay, so there's going to be, um, we are in this age right now. Okay, so you have the parentheses, you have parentheses, you have the church age, and there are wars and desolations that are happening now. We are the church age. Okay, one thing to keep in mind is that the Old Testament prophets never saw the church. Okay, so if you go back to the Old Testament prophets in Daniel, there's no mention of the church. The Old Testament prophets never saw the church. Okay, what they did, they saw only the program, God's program for his chosen people. So, um, we are in this, that's why I have it in parentheses, okay, because you will not find the church. Say, amillennialists, uh, or Reformed theology, the, theology will see the church. They'll say, oh, okay, Israel sinned and they forfeited all their blessings, so now all the blessings have been transferred to the church. And uh, I remember when I was in school, I, uh, we were studying the book of Isaiah, and um, I looked at this book, you know, it was Young's uh, on Isaiah, you know, a guy named Young, and it was really, really good. But then it was, you know, he'd be talking about Israel, and all of a sudden he mentioned the church. So I went to the doctor and said, what is this, what is he talking about? I'm confused here. I said, oh, he's an amillennialist, okay? He doesn't believe in a literal millennialist, and he sees the church as equal to Israel. So he said, you just have to ignore that. He has a lot of good stuff, but when it comes to his eschatology, um, he's off base. Okay, so since my professor told me that, I took, took it for his, you know, my And, you know, uh, yeah, there's, it's very clear. Israel's Israel, the church is, is a church. But the Old Testament prophets didn't see well, the church. So you have here in verse 26, um, where Daniel sees the uh, 69 weeks, Christ is cut off, Messiah is cut off, and then he jumps to the tribulation. So he doesn't see the rapture either, okay? The rapture is for the church. He didn't see the rapture. So verse 27, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So he'll make the covenant the beginning of the seven years, the, tri the beginning of the tribulation. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction one that is decreed, decreed is poured out on the one who makes who makes desolate. Okay, so what what this chart shows according to Daniel is that Antichrist comes, make a covenant with Israel at the beginning of seven weeks, the middle of the seven weeks, three and a half years, he breaks that covenant. Okay, and then you have what we call the Great Tribulation, where you can say all hell is gonna break loose. All right, because that's what's gonna have to be worse. Uh, the first three and a half years is going to be a time of relative peace. And we're going to talk about that. What could be happening? Why is there peace? Why is, uh, why is Israel going to put their hope in this leader? Okay, the possibilities. But in the middle of the tribulation, the middle of the 70th week, Antichrist is going to break that covenant and then you come to the, uh, the last three and a half years. Okay, and then you have... Um, under the one, the seventh week of day, I have AD question mark. Why is that? Because we don't know when that's going to happen. Okay, we don't know when this is going to happen. And then the second coming of Christ, and then the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. Okay? So this is a chart that I put together, and thanks to Mitchell Chun, he made it really nice. He had to put the graphics of you know, Christ in the cross, and uh, he did some magic on his computer several years ago when we were going through Daniel. So that's what we're going to be talking about during this, the next uh, few months, chapter 6 through 19, um, the, the, the seventieth week of Daniel. Okay, so this rider on the white horse, you go back to chapter 6, the rider on the white horse. Okay. Again, in the middle of the, uh, the beginning of the seventh week, Antichrist pledges to protect Israel against the outside attack. And many speculate that 
if Israel agrees to surrender occupied therapy, uh, th territory and to, be to begin disarmament. Okay, so what is going to happen here? Speculation, but it could be that Antichrist is going to come and is going to convince Israel, you know what, everything's going to be different. Do away with your arms. Okay, do away with your weapons and your military and uh, just surrender your territory. Trust me and everything will be fine. Okay, for some reason, and we're going to see that Antichrist is very, very persuasive. But we're going to, you know, it's possible that uh, for some reason Israel is going to do that. It's going to become defenseless. Okay, so chapter 6, verse 1, the, the white horse, chapter 6, verse 2, the ride on the white horse, um, I believe is the Antichrist. Okay, where Israel possibly sees this rider as a political savior. Okay, the white, the white color. Uh, shows that he is a counterfeit Messiah. Because when you look at chapter 19, if you go back to chapter 19, verse 11, you find that Jesus Christ himself is going to return to the earth on a white horse after the tribulation. Chapter 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Okay, One, another reason why I believe Antichrist is here in chapter 6 is that look at the context. You have these four, four uh, horses and riders. Okay? There's nothing positive about the other three. There's nothing positive. You're going to have death. You're going to have famine. You know, you're gonna, uh, uh, it's it's going to be a terrible uh, situation here. Okay? So... Um, we have here the, the white horse in chapter 6, verse 2, the person dressed in white, the false, uh, the false Messiah. Here's something you might have not noticed, but it kind of just kind of stood out after I read this over and over again. This rider has a bow, right? This rider has a bow. But you notice he doesn't have any arrows. He doesn't have any arrows. He carries a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. What is the bow a symbol of? When the ancient the Israelites went to battle, the, the, the archers carried the bows. It was a symbol of war. Okay? So the bow is a symbol of war, but the absence of arrows implies that the victory is a bloodless one. Okay? It's a bloodless uh, victory. So another way of looking at it, it's a peace. It's a peace that is won by deceit. Okay? So somehow the Antichrist is going to convince uh, Israel and others that hey he is the political savior of this world because look at all the if you look at how things are bad right now it's going to get worse okay and you can you can say the Antichrist is going to come and say look I'll make everything right all you got to do is do this give up this give up this and I can guarantee that there is going to be peace so um, with shrewdness and with covenant or treaty and not war. Um, he's going to establish peace. And that's what Daniel 9.27 tells us. Okay, Daniel 9.27. So Daniel predicted that the false messiah would destroy many at a time when they feel secure and they, they, they believe they live in peace. You go back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He mentions that, Daniel 8.25. So Daniel predicted this false messiah would destroy many at the time when they feel that they're at peace. Okay? And so in other words, when the middle, he breaks the covenant at the middle of the tribulation. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul declared that the destruction would swiftly follow the, the cries of peace in the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. So even Paul predicted that. So where does uh, this writer, this Antichrist, get his crown? From Satan. We're going to see that Satan is going to be the one who influences, empowers Antichrist and the false prophet later on uh, to, to convince people that, wow, these people are really amazing. They must be sent from, from God himself. So Satan gives the writer the Antichrist a crown. Uh, and so the false Messiah will accept this as this, this gift from Satan. Why? Because his ultimate purpose is to conquer the world. Okay. 
So um, that's why I believe chapter 6, verse 2 is talking about the Antichrist, the false writer, okay, because Jesus Christ comes back in chapter 14. And so it can't be, or well, chapter 19. So it can't be, you know, which one is which. And when you look at the context, doom and gloom in chapter 6, um, different picture in chapter 19. So the context says that something's not right here. This is something that's evil and deceitful and that fits in with the Antichrist. Okay, any questions about that? Um, study it more on your own, okay? Study it more. But again, uh, that's what I see here. Okay, one more. Let's go one more. The second seal. Second seal is found in verses 3 and 4. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. By the way, you know, um, let's back up uh, a second. I want to talk about chapter 19, verse 11, okay, about Christ coming. If you notice uh, the contrast between the rider on the white horse in chapter 6 and Christ, okay, notice uh, so in chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, You notice here in chapter 19, verse 11, Jesus Christ doesn't need a bow. Okay. He is the word of God. All he has to do is speak it. All he has to do is speak. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. The word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. Okay? So all he has to do is speak. He doesn't have to carry a bow you know, because Christ is the word. And so that's, uh, and so there's no picture, there's no, it's, he's, there's no similar description as we find in chapter 6. So I just wanted to throw that out. Okay, the second horse the color of blood and the mark of warfare. So Jesus, oh, John saw that this writer had uh, the power to take peace from the earth and to create worldwide war where violence will be commonplace. So think about this. For peace to be taken away, it has to be in existence at the time it is taken away, right? So there has to be peace that is present and so for peace to be taken away, it must exist in the Middle East just prior to the movement of the Red Horse. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 38, um, Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, the prophet predicted that in the latter times of Israel's future, there would be an invasion uh, of the land from the north. Okay? Ezekiel 38, an invasion of the land from the north. Okay? Uh, this is not the Battle of Armageddon. This is a separate battle. And this northern invader, many people believe this is Russia, we don't know, will come when the nation of Israel is at rest. Okay, and Ezekiel describes uh, this, this nation as uh, being at rest with unwalled villages. Okay, and in Ezekiel's day, a city with no walls was defenseless. It was, it was defenseless, it was vulnerable, and totally unprepared for war. So, for some reason, Jerusalem, Israel, is not going to be prepared for war. Why? Because they're living in peace. A peace that um, results because they were persuaded by the Antichrist to do what they do was, was necessary in order to bring about this peace. So, Ezekiel says there's going to be an invasion from the north. And, uh, you know, Israel, as uh, I've never been to Israel, but I've heard that Israel is very, very, uh, has a powerful defense. 
It has a very, very strong defense, and its military is one of the world's strongest, even though it's a small nation. So something must happen. And again, this is speculating. Something must happen that will cause her to surrender her weapons. And that event might be the, the, the treaty or the covenant of protection with the false messiah. And then if it is indeed Russia that makes an invasion from the north, then it will take advantage of Israel's weakness and move towards the promised land. So the result will be the removal of peace, uh, the killing of many, and uh, lots of war and bloodshed. And that we see by, we see that by the, uh, the second rider, the rider on the red horse. Okay. Are you guys following along so far? Okay, all right. So next week we're going to look at the, uh, the third seal. Okay, we're going to look at uh, the black horse, and then we're going to look at the fourth seal, the, the horse with a pale or ashen color. Okay. In the Greek, the pale or ashen is chloros, C-H-L-O-R-O-S. We get the word chlorophyll, chlorophyll. So this writer is, um, uh, has kind of an ashen gray-green look. Okay. But uh, so the, the, the ashen or pale is the Greek word uh, chloros, and we get chlorophyll from that. But we're going to look at the third and fourth writers uh, next week. So be sure and bring all of your handouts and your, uh, your notes uh, back with us, back to our study next week, and then uh, we'll, we'll finish that, and then I probably might hand out uh, the outline for chapter 7 even for chapters 8 through 10. They'll be printed this week. Okay. Plus, there's other charts. So, so uh, don't miss. Right? Don't miss because there's a lot of handouts coming. So build your library. Build your, uh, your resources. Okay? And bring your folder with you every week because we're going to go back to that and we're going to just try to make sense of the content. Okay? Don't worry about the chronology, but that's for your information. Right. So I, I hope you can see that a study of Revelation can take a long, long time. You can spend days and days and days. Okay. Uh, I've already shared, I've spent long days. Okay. I spent as much time that I did working for the state at my desk. Okay. Maybe that's why my back is hurting a lot. Okay. <laughs> Bob tells me you got to put some heat on it. Maybe I just need to get up or stand and study because I think that maybe I'm sitting too long. But it's, uh, there are times when you just don't want to get away. It's so exciting, so interesting. Uh, I just want to keep working at it. Okay, so I hope that I can convey some of the excitement to you. And at the end of our study, you'll be able to say, now I understand the book of Revelation a lot better. And I'm not afraid uh, of it anymore. Okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you so much for that which all that we have learned thus far in this, uh, our study of the book of Revelation. And uh, continue to open our eyes of understanding and uh, just to remind ourselves over and over again that uh, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is indeed worthy. He is indeed worthy of our worship, of our praise, of all the glory and honor that is due to him. And uh, the days ahead, Lord, may this truth uh, be well ingrained in our hearts and may we come to appreciate our Savior more and more. Especially at this time of the year when we, uh, our eyes are focused on the birth of our Savior. There's a reason why He came, Lord. And we just thank You so much for uh, the salvation that He has provided through His uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, thank you so much for uh, enlightening our eyes. And I trust that you, you know, we have been encouraged as we have uh, studied this important book in, in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.